about our topic for discussion today. And uh, before your calls uh, come in, we are going to continue uh, in the same light with uh, the analysis uh, with uh, these, uh, uh, this panel of experts. Let's uh, continue with, with you, uh, Jang. Uh, of course, we are talking about uh, Africa uh, being at the central stage. We are looking at the G20, which is uh, the uh, latest uh, block that has admitted or recognized uh, uh, the uh, capacity of African uh, continent or the African Union that can hold a permanent membership in uh, these uh, uh, worst economic block. So the question is, in uh, wanting to fight poverty or to er uh, eradicate poverty, to boost uh, infrastructure, and of course to ensure access to health and uh, education. So now, how can uh, the, uh, the, the group of 20 be uh, a, a, a catalyst uh, that will facilitate uh, uh, Africa realizing uh, these uh, very important uh, aspects. You know, the OSC, an earning population cannot actually deliver. So how can the group of 20 assist uh, the African continent in the sphere of poverty er er eradication, infrastructure development, health care, and education? Gladys, like I had already said, technology transfer would be one of the major criterion that has to be considered. And I can firsthand tell you that I was present in many of the G20 deliberations that happened, and uh, I very well understand the inhibitions that Elijah has due to the historical reasons, but I can firsthand tell you that uh, even this year during the deliberations of G20 during the meetings, these issues were actually discussed. And like Purnima Madam has mentioned that we are talking about human-centric development. So when we talk about human-centric development, we do not differentiate people on the basis of nationality. Absolutely. We have had discussions on issues like poverty eradication, about access to education and health, about access to infrastructure, to the African nations, to the most poverty stricken African nations. We want, we really want the African children to have access to quality education so that they can raise, rise up as, you know, empowered individuals and they can then contribute to the global development. Mm -hmm. So I, while I understand the inhibitions that we have, but I strongly feel we have to move past the suspicions because, you know, I agree when you say that the, there is a debt problem. We need restructuring of debt. I do not deny that. But the good thing is we have started talking about it. We need to realize that the financial institutions like uh, IMF or World Bank, they were formed post-World War II era. And they were formed keeping that those situations in mind. Now we are in post-COVID phase. So now the... Now we need new systems, we need new thoughts, we need new policies. And that is exactly the direction we are moving in. We have been talking about multilateral banks, we have been talking about debt restructuring, we have been talking about climate financing. The principle of polluter pays has been there for decades. So I for sure is hopeful because I have been a part of the deliberations and I know that this has been in the hearts and minds of the delegates from across the globe. Uh, one thing that I want to really point out is we have to stop differentiating in the post-COVID world order. We have to stop differentiating on the basis of nations, on the basis of any man-made, human-made dif distinctions. I always say there's one thing that the virus taught us that there's no distinction. The way COVID impacted people in Africa, the same way it impacted people in Asia. We humans need to realize that we are, we are talking about shared future and that can only come when all of us come together as one human being. And that was exactly the theme of India's G20 presidency, Vasudev Kutumbakam. That is, we are one family, one earth, and we have a one future. We have a shared future. So my request to everyone hearing us today would be to stand together as one human beings. Let us stop differentiating. We have to build that trust. 
we have to work to, on building the trust deficit. There's a lot of deficit in trust, and that is why we are always thinking in those terms. But the need of the hour is to break that trust deficit. And I feel that the youth has a major role to play in that. So I, for sure, is very hopeful. And uh, for me, the first process is discussions. I'm sure it will take time for it to get implemented, but at least the right questions are being raised. We are thinking in the right direction. The right questions are being raised at the right platforms. And in future, we will have those uh, memorandums signed. We will have those technologies transferred. If I talk about India, maybe three decades back, even we were facing these problems of technology transfer. So it is a process. It is not a one day thing. It is a process and we are moving in the right direction. So let us be hopeful. That is my request to each one of you. Uh, uh, listening to you, Kinley, uh, I will stay with you, Jain. Uh, talking about uh, building trust and, of course, uh, uh, ensuring uh, uh, that everyone is included as far as uh, uh, the global changes are concerned, do you think with uh, the uh, recent uh, geopolitical maneuver or geopolitical shift in, uh, words, uh, in, uh, in the global world, is it going to be very practical or is it a philosophy, that philosophy, how pragmatic? is that philosophy of inclusivity and of course ensuring one planet one earth and of course all for humanity Clarice definitely I would not say that uh, it is a very easy path definitely not these are uh, you know years of distrust years of uh, mistrust and there are real problems we have been witnessing uh, geopolitical uh, issues all across the globe. And that is why there's more need to build that trust. And dialogue, you know, war can never be a solution. The only solution could be dialogue. Maybe when we start thinking like one human being, we will understand that there's no difference between me and Mr. Arthur. The rights and duties of Mr. Arthur towards this earth are similar to mine, or the rights or duties of Mr. Elija would, are similar to us He's sitting here in India. And similarly, a person in the US has to understand that. Once we understand that, once we understand the human-centric nature of things, and COVID, again, I would point out, has shown this to the world. Mm -hmm. The problem is we have a very small memory. That virus did not differentiate on the basis of nation, nationality, religion, race, color, or anything. The whole world came to a standstill. Yeah. I think that should come as an eye opener to all of us that when something of that order, when a problem of that order comes, then the whole race, human race, is at risk. And we could only surpass it as one common people. I would talk about the Maitri uh, that uh, the, our Honorable Prime Minister started. We were following the vaccine diplomacy because we care for every human being in every part of the world. And that once that is ingrained in our mind and heart, I, I think that will be a solution. And therefore, I say that the youth has a major role to play because we are kind of dissociated, I would not say completely dissociated with the past, but kind of, we can get over the past slightly easier and we have to come with out of the box solutions. I would come to the New Delhi Declaration. Till the last moment, there was a doubt that the New Delhi Declaration would be passed. Yeah. Interesting thing with G20 is even if one nation does a veto against the declaration, it is not passed. Mm -hmm. But those 20 nations came together and passed a declaration. That is, an, that is a testimony to the fact that when it comes to global issues, we all can have internal issues. I'm not talking about that. But when we have a global issue at hand, we can come together. And New Delhi Declaration is a testimony.